Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It is five o'clock. Now, we probably will have a couple more people join us, but we are going to get started. Um, first, thank you so much for joining uh, Nevada Department of Wildlife for an education program this evening. Uh, before we jump in, <clears throat> I just want to remind everyone that this is a family program and it's rated PG. Um, we have the ability to remove anyone from the webinar this evening if we feel that um, behavior is not appropriate. Um, we do have a few ways that we'll be interacting with you guys. Uh, first, my name is Jess Brooks. I work for the Nevada Department of Wildlife. I am the Southern Region Wildlife Education Coordinator. We also have Julie uh, Watson. She is going to be my moderator this evening. Now, the ways that we'll be interacting with you, we have a chat box that I will be watching. Um, I do have some questions for you guys, um, and you should be able to talk to each other through that chat. We also have a Q&A box, a question and answer box. If you do have questions throughout the presentation this evening, I encourage you to ask your questions through the Q&A box. Julie, our moderator, Julie Watson, who is awesome, she will be looking at those Q&As, those questions, and answering them live. I won't be able to see the, the questions as they're coming in. Um, to get to the Q&A box and to the chat box, you should see um, options at the top of your screen or at the bottom of your screen, depending on how your computer is set up. If you click on them, um, you should be able to uh, type in your questions, type in the chat. I do have the chat open right now. If you would like to test it, see how it works, I'm gonna be turning it on and off throughout the presentation, so I do have control over that. Um, this evening, we are talking about birds and migration. Um, I hope you're here for that topic. Um, like I said, thank you so much. We have <clears throat> so many of these uh, presentations, so many of these webinars. This is one of my favorite topics. I'm so excited to talk about it. And hopefully, we will be learning some of these things together. Hello, I can see everyone talking in the chat. So thank you so much for testing that out for me. Um, okay, so first we're going to get to know the landscape, just a tad. We're going to talk about what wildlife needs to survive. How do we know a bird's migration path? And where do they stop and rest? Um, the picture that you see on your screen is a large flock of birds at um, a wildlife management area. So very first, um, the very first topic, and this is super basic, but it is extremely important, and I'm gonna leave the chat open for this. What does wildlife need to survive? Um, clue, there are four things that wildlife needs to survive. Um, go ahead and type your answers in in the chat. I can see the chat. So I will be watching for those four things. I'm gonna give everyone just a couple minutes. If you only know one of the things, that's fine, go ahead and type them in. I'm gonna be reading them off as they come in. All right, Laura, I see food, water. Mark, I see food, water, and housing. Food, water, habitat, great. Now there is a fourth thing. Food, water, shelter, and safety, getting closer. Space, Thomas, excellent. Air. Mark, thank you for typing that in. That kind of falls into that space category. Um, great. Thank you so much for participating, guys. I love it. Nests from Catherine. Awesome. Okay. Um, if you don't know the answer, totally fine. That's why we're here. After all, we're here to learn. Um, I'm going to leave the chat running just for a moment. The answer, and it does cover a lot of general, is food, water, shelter, and space. Now I did see someone type in air that does count for space. This makes up a bird's habitat. This makes up any wildlife's habitat anyway, um, but you and wildlife does need these four things to survive, food, water, shelter, and space. Now flyways mark the migration path. They're also called migration flyways. There are 
four in North America. There are the Pacific, the Central, the Mississippi, and the Atlantic migration flyways. Now, before we continue, I'm going to turn off the chat just for a moment until I need you again. Um, now, on the map here, I did put a yellow star then. That, now, that yellow star mar marks where we are. We are in the state of Nevada, so that yellow star is Nevada. And the Pacific Flyway, which is where we are, we cover that purple on the map, stretches 4,000 miles north to south and 1,000 miles east to west, so it does cover a lot of ground. It covers the Arctic to the west coast of Mexico and to the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Ocean. So all the way from the very northern to the very middle-ish part of Baja, California and Mexico, and as far as all the way from the coast to the tippy tippy top of the Rocky Mountains. Um, the Pacific Migration Flyway has the most varied waterfowl habitats in North America, which is a really unique quality of this migration flyway, which is super cool. Um, our flyway, the Pacific, covers Alaska, Arizona, California, Idaho, Nevada, of course, Oregon, Utah, Washington, parts of Colorado, right, to the Rocky Mountains. It also covers Montana, New Mexico, Wyoming, west of the Continental Divide, the Canadian provinces of British Columbia, Alberta, the Yukon, and Northwest Territories. Now, it does cover a lot of ground. Now, this is, um, this is an image, a map image of all of or some of those states along the west coast. And all of these red spots that you see cover really popular stopover sites. Now a stopover site is a crucial part of the migration path for migrating birds. It's where they find food, shelter, water, space, all of those four big things that make up a bird's habitat. And you'll also see three yellow stars in the state of Nevada that marks around Reno, around Elko, and around Las Vegas. We have in the state of Nevada not very many um, crucial stops, crucial stopover sites, but the ones that we do have are so important along that migration flyway. Each of these stopover sites serve as a very small oasis in the desert landscape. After all, um, this part of the country, especially Nevada, most of Arizona and Utah, it is sort of a barren landscape. There are a lot of mountains, hillsides, um, low desert, high desert. So the birds need these crucial stopover sites and the ones that we do have are so important. So we've six, we've gotten to know our landscape just a little bit. Um, we're going to get to know our birds now. So we're going to talk about what makes a bird special. And these are questions that I kind of want the whole audience to think about while we're going through the presentation. And again, if you do have questions, um, our moderator, Miss Julie, will be answering them live. Uh, so we're going to talk about what makes a bird special, why birds migrate in the first place. There are four types of migration. We're going to go over those. How do birds know when to migrate? Uh, some specialized senses, which are very, very cool. And then at the very end, we're going to test your knowledge. We're going to go through some quick identification of some common birds that we've got. OK, so very, very first, what makes a bird special? What makes a bird endothermic? And something that I'm going to open up to the chat, because I want to see if there's anyone out there that knows the difference between endothermic and ectothermic. So I have the chat open. Go ahead and plug your answers in. I want to know if you know what is endothermic mean. And I'll tell you if you don't know, but I do want to see if there's anyone out there that does know. I'm going to give you guys just a couple moments. No Googling, because I know you guys have access to that. I want to know if you already know this. All right, uh, Cheryl says, regulates their own body temperature. Excellent. Gen generate their own heat. Thank you, Thomas. 
If you're not sure, totally okay. We're here to learn. I remember learning this for the very first time way back, way, way back in the day. Warm-blooded. Oh, man, you guys are really close. Make their own body. Excellent. You guys are smart. I'm super impressed. I'm going to keep the chat running just for seconds, just in case there are some other ants coming in. Endothermic means um, warm-blooded. That's another way of putting it. Um, this means that they are capable of internally generating heat. So good job, everybody. They can make their own body heat even when it's cold outside. Warm-blooded animals have body temperatures that usually stay pretty the same. There is a range. Um, ectothermic, on the other hand, is cold-blooded. Um, these are animals like lizards, snakes, reptiles, and amphibians. Um, but for our birds, um, they're endothermic, which means they're warm-blooded. They can generate their own body heat. Most can fly. They lay eggs. They can live in a variety of homes. And I have a couple pictures for you, um, which is really cool to see. This is a picture of a great horned owl with two owlets in the tree. Now they do blend in very well. I also have a picture of a great horned owl living in a cactus. So this is just one small example. Um, this is one small example of every, of all of the birds being able to live in a variety of homes. Now for now, I'm gonna turn off the chat. I am following the chat, just so you guys know. Um, I just got a comment that says, my chat box says all panelists and attendees. Um, the things that I'm reading, everyone can, everyone should be able to see. And Julie is watching the chat with me as well. Alrighty, let's jump back in. Most mate for life, which is kind of a cool thing. I really like reading about that. Um, their bodies and anatomy are perfect for flight. Now we are gonna talk about this just a little bit more in a little bit. Um, birds have avian bones. Um, avian bones are a little bit special. They do have some special qualities, really unique qualities about them that I'll show you. Some migrate to find more resources. Now that does mean that there are birds that don't migrate and we're gonna talk about that too. So real quick, some unique bird anatomy. If you don't know, what you're looking at here is a wood duck. They have a very cool face. It looks like they were hand painted. Um, very, very first, they generate lift when they fly. To do this, they have airfoil shaped wings, and that means that there's a special curvature to the wings, very similar to an airplane, but a little bit more curvature. Obviously, airplanes don't have that really dramatic curve. And I have another picture that we're going to talk about that a little bit more in detail. They also have extremely strong chest muscles. Um, they reduce weight when they fly. They don't have any fat deposits. So there are a lot of other animals, mammals in particular, that have fat deposits. Birds do not have any fat deposits at all, which helps them stay lightweight. They have small, single organs. In fact, there are some birds out there, namely the great horned owl, that when they're not in breeding season, the females can sort of knock one of their ovaries out of commission, making it making their bodies um, a little bit lighter. And then when breeding season kicks back in, they can um, use those ovaries again. They have a hollow bone structure. It's not completely hollow. It, it, it does have sort of a spider web feature to it. And I have some close up pictures that are really cool to see. They have waterproof feathers. Um, a lot of birds have preening oil from a gland that is secreted just above their tailbone and birds will use this oil to keep their feathers clean, healthy, waterproof. They'll groom themselves with this. They also reduce drag when they fly. So they do have a very aerodynamic and streamlined body shape, especially this wood duck. You can see how his beak and his plume up here on his head is curved back, 
making it easy for the air to flow over and around his body. They have backward facing feathers. So all their feathers come out of their skin facing backwards. Um, they don't have any feathers that are facing forwards. That would make them very not aerodynamic. Um, their wings are developed for flight and support. So most birds can fly and some are much better than others. Now, before I talk about this airfoil shape, there are some birds that can't fly. So I'm gonna open up the chat one more time. It was closed. Um, right now, it should say that you can participate in the chat. It should say all panelists and attendees, for those of you who were um, noticing um, some of that stuff, no problem, I see, I see you guys. Um, okay, so my question is, are there birds that can't fly? There are. What are they? Can anyone name any of those birds that can't fly? There are quite a few. All right, Mark says, penguins, ostrich, and emu. Penguins, penguins, ostrich. Ooh, Aria, good job. Cassowaries, excellent. Wow, guys, chickens. In fact, there are some chickens that can fly very short distances, but they can. <laughs> A silky, wow. Kiwis, oh, they're my favorite. I love kiwis. Quail, excellent. Um, Eduardo, I saw that you typed in quail. Quail do fly, short bursts. They're not excellent flyers. They kind of just um, jump and then glide from point A to point B, but that is considered flying. Uh, penguins, ostriches, great job, everyone. Blue jays, blue jays do fly. Any others? All right, Ria's perfect. All right, I'm gonna close the chat just for a moment. I promise I have more questions for everybody. Um, so let's talk about this airfoil shape. We mentioned it earlier. You see it on your screen. What it does is it helps guide airflow over and around the body, generating lift and reducing drag. Um, it also reduces air pressure. So when birds are flapping and flying, having this airfoil shape, this curvature, this really aerodynamic wing structure and shape, there's a constant air pressure underneath so it keeps them in the air. There's also reduced air pressure above. So what that does is um, reduces energy that the birds have to put out into the world to actually fly. So it's energy efficient. It helps them stay in the air. We've actually learned from this structure too. Um, a lot of our airplanes have this very basic airfoil shape. It's not as curved as much, but it does resemble this shape. And then feathers. So the wings and feathers are for flight and support. Birds are the only, only animals that have feathers and feathers make up a light but very strong structure that help keep the bird warm as well. Uh, there are lots of different types of feathers. You'll see on your screen that there are tail feathers. They're typically the strongest. There are flight feathers, which are normally this leading edge right here on the front part of their wing. That's what the air hits first when they fly. Also very, very strong. They have semi-plumes, phylo-plumes, bristles, which can kind of also be whiskers for some birds. We'll talk about that too a little bit. And downy feathers. Downy feathers are feathers that birds are born with. They're the cute fluffy ones that chicks are born with and they help keep the bird warm. And this is a, a, a drawing of a close up of some of that feather structure. So you'll see, I'm gonna pull out my pointer here, my laser pointer. You'll see here, this is center of the feather. And then you'll see these other parts branching out. And what's in the middle here is this Velcro hook and barb structure that help keep the feather all in a line, all nice and flat. So avian bones, this is one of the coolest things about birds. I absolutely love it. Avian bones are pneumatized, which means they're full of spaces of air. And here's a drawing of a human bone versus a bird bone. And you'll notice that in the bird bone, they have large air pockets 
as opposed to a human bone, which has a, a central core or a bone marrow and a bone that's more solid toward the joint. So I have a question for you guys. It's actually a poll. So if I could get my moderator, Miss Julie, to pull up that poll. It's a true or false. This air-filled bone structure helps birds fly because it makes them lighter. Now I'm gonna give you guys just a few moments to answer. For those of you who don't know, totally okay. You know, after all, we're here to learn. And I'm watching you guys vote too. So 50% of you have voted, thank you. 62% have voted. Come on guys, let's get those votes in so I can share the answer. 66%. I love that you guys are participating. Thank you so much. Alrighty, just about 75% of you have voted. Just a few more seconds and then I'll ask my moderator, Julie, to share the results with you guys. Alrighty, let's, let's end that poll just so we can. So 75% of you voted, excellent. Most of you said true, 88% of you said true. One, um, three percent of you said false and ten percent of you said I'm not sure totally cool thank you so much for participating um, I'm gonna close that poll perfect um, so the answer is false it, it's a huge myth it, I hear it all the time um, but now you guys know it's false bird skeletons weigh just as much as mammal skeletons of the same size um, there's a couple reasons for this myth. Um, avian bones, bird bones, the material is denser than mammal bones. So where there is bone existing within all of this structure right here where I'm highlighting, and there are all those air pockets, where there is bone, it is much denser. So it's actually a little bit stronger than the material in a human bone. So there's more air, denser bone, just it helps the, it helps the birds um, stay strong in their bones. It maximizes the stiffness and strength relative to their weight. So they're not any heavier or lighter as far as their skeletons are concerned. concerned. The rest of their um, anatomy, like the fact that they have airfoil shaped wings, they have feathers that are light and strong, they can um, decommission some of those organs when they're not being in, when they're not in use. Birds have all these other ways to make them lighter. Their skeleton, however, is not one of them. Birds can take in, or sorry, birds can take in more oxygen with every breath, both inhaling and exhaling. And this, all these air pockets within their bone helps with that. So with every single breath, inhaling and exhaling, birds are taking in more oxygen with every single breath. So the answer is false. Thank you so much for participating. And now you know, which is cool. And here is a close up. Um, this is actually a, an artist's rendition of a bird bone that was shaved away and broken open. And you can see all of those air pockets within that bone structure. It's very, very cool. Alrighty, so how do birds migrate? Birds migrate to move from areas, areas of low resources to areas of high resources. So there are two primary resources that birds are looking for. And this could be a variety of things. I'm gonna open up the chat to see if you guys can tell me what those things are. So the chat is open. I'm gonna see if you can tell me what those two main resources are that birds are looking for. And I'm gonna give you guys just a few moments. All right, Kate says food and habitat. I do see some questions coming in. Um, Sally, thank you so much for your question. Um, I actually have a special person on standby mod, uh, moderating, her name is Julie. If you could type in your question in the Q&A box, the question and answer box. 
um, she can answer that live if for whatever reason there are so many awesome questions and we don't get to them by the end we can go back and answer some of those questions okay so I see food food and shelter nesting sites warmth all of these are pretty much correct um, there are two primary resources though food and water and nesting opportunities so those of you who said warmth perfect supporting body temperature yes that's um, one of the things that they're looking for they're they're always looking for a more perfect habitat so if it's too cold they'll move to a location where it's warmer if it's too hot they'll move to a location where it's cooler where there's more food and more water and more nesting opportunities um, on the left, I did want to point out that for those of you who have guidebooks at home, um, we have these maps um, all the time. And it's sometimes a little bit difficult to see exactly what it's showing you. But in this map, there are four colors in a lot of the um, guidebooks, the Peterson Field Guide or the Audubon Field Guides, they'll either have four colors similar to this one or three colors. And most of them will have breeding. So that's when you'll be able to find this bird when it's breeding season, migration, winter, and if this bird exists in that location year round. So that's sort of how you read that map. So why do birds migrate? Birds that nest in the Northern Hemisphere, that's where we are, tend to migrate north in the spring and south in the winter. So in the spring, birds are taking advantage of all of the insect populations bursting, all of the fresh plants that are just budding, and all of this abundance of nesting locations. In the winter, however, the number of insects available drops, all the plants can die, so they'll travel to warmer areas to help keep their body at a, um, a a more, a more optimal temperature, there's more places to nest, more places to find food. So here in the Northern Hemisphere, they go north in the spring and south in the winter. There are um, different kinds of migration. There are four different types. Um, as a broad term though, migration itself is periodic large-scale movements of any type of animal population. So there are other animals that migrate, not just birds. Um, can anyone tell me what some of those animals are? In the chat, sorry. <laughs> I, do, I do see the chat open. Yes, whales migrate, absolutely. Zebras migrate, butterflies migrate. You guys are so smart. I'm so glad that you're participating. Um, wildebeest migrate, spiders migrate. Yes, here in the Southern region of Nevada, in the Mojave Desert, we have tarantula migrations every year that happen around October. It's spectacular to watch. Mormon crickets migrate. Yes, elk, deer, ladybugs. Awesome. So if we look at bird migration, there are different kinds of migration and we look at them based on the distance that's traveled. And it's split up into four different groups. There are permanent residents, of course. They do not migrate. There are short distance migrants. They only move a very short distance. This could be um, a couple miles to um, maybe 300 to 500 miles. It's usually across state lines. There's medium distance. Um, these usually span from one to several states difference. And then last but not least, there's long distance migrants. Now these can cover several states, even countries. So how do birds know when to migrate? Now this is sort of a loaded question, sort of a difficult one to answer. Birds can sense the changing of the seasons based on a lot of different things. Um, they first measure or sense the amount of light in each hour in the day. And that's how they sense which way is north and which way is south as well. They're looking at the angle of the sun and the moon because that does change throughout the year. 
and they're looking at the stars in the sky. Now you can test this too, it's really fun. You can go out um, in the summertime at nine, 10 o'clock at night and look at the stars, see if you can identify any constellations. And then you can go out again, four in the morning, five in the morning, and those constellations have moved. You can also go out at 10 o'clock at night in the middle of winter, you know, bundle up, go outside and look at the stars, identify those uh, constellations, and then go out again at four in the morning, five in the morning, those constellations will have changed. So depending on the time of year and the time, at, time of night, those constellations can tell a bird what time it is, what time of year it is. It helps them figure out when they migrate. Um, humans also know what seasons, um, not to the same degree, um, but we can see and feel some generalities for when seasons are changing. And how do we know? I'm gonna leave it up to you guys in the chat. I want you to be able to tell me there are lots of correct answers. Um, the chat is open. So I want to see if you can tell me how humans know when the seasons change. Um, maybe tell me some examples. Foliage change, perfect. Eduardo, thank you. So in the springtime, uh, new plants are budding, and in the fall, we get a lot of leaf change colors. Um, <laughs> Jonathan says, my joints, absolutely. <laughs> I like that answer. Longer and shorter days, more sun, less sun. Perfect, Cheryl, thank you. Oh, Sally, Sally says, animal migration observations. That's awesome. Yes, actually, um, in the late fall, early winter, migration season will start. And then that will last up until early to mid spring. So when we see that happen, it's our cue that winter is coming. Perfect. The position the sun is, angle of the sun, the time of sunrise, sunset. I love it. Circadian rhythms. Thank you, Erin. I love that answer. If you don't know what circadian rhythms are, you should Google it. It's a little bit long for me to explain here, but it's very useful for humans. Okay, I'm gonna close the chat just for a moment. Oh, tornado seasons from Chrissy. Thank you, Chrissy. Welcome from the Midwest. All right, so I'm gonna share with you just a few extremely basic examples. All of you are correct. Thank you for sharing. But um, I just have four really basic examples. One is the winter season when days are the shortest, summer season when days are longest, typical to start getting cold in the fall and typically starts to get hot in the spring. Now, we did cover all that. Um, you guys actually covered it a little bit more extantly, so thank you. Um, birds also watch landmarks, very similar to how we watch landmarks. Birds watch for changes in those landmarks like rivers, mountains. Um, a river might change depending on the season. You know, it might sink or rise depending on um, how much rain we're getting. Um, here in Nevada, we do have monsoon seasons. Um, and as far as the light is concerned, hitting those geographic landmarks, the light hitting the mountain or hillside might indicate a change in the season, a change in the time, a change in the weather or temperature. Oh, and here are some examples. Um, the upper picture that you guys are looking at is the river as it's sinking and the lower temperature is the beginning of fall to be, um, so you can see all of those rivers are dropping. Okay, birds use their senses a little bit more sophisticated than us. Um, birds can sense the changes in their barometric pressure and magnetic, ugh, magnetic fields that are invisible to the human eye. Um, some of us can feel this for those of us who said that we can sense changes on, in the atmosphere or changes in the weather or the seasons based on how our joints feel. It's somewhat of a similar sensation. Um, barometric pressure measures um, the pressure in the air. Basically, high pressure or cold temperatures will sink and low pressure or warmer temperatures will rise and birds can sense this. So air pressure is lowest during the summer. 
and hot air is less dense than cold air and um, cause air to expand. So whenever we have a storm rolling through, that's typically a high pressure movement. Whenever we have those big white fluffy clouds that are flat on the bottom, that's a signal that we have a very unstable atmosphere. And those can go in layers. It might be a high pressure layer and a low pressure layer. And then again, a high pressure layer on top of that because low pressure, that warmer will, will rise and create those big, beautiful, fluffy clouds. So birds can also sense north. We did talk a little bit about this, but um, birds have a few anatomy um, features that help them um, sense where north is so they know where to travel and which direction to travel. So their eyes and their brain. Birds' eyes imprint on the patterns of the sun and the stars. Remember we talked about the stars moving and the angle of the sun. The chemical reactions between the eyes and the brain um, work with magnetic poles in the earth to help sense which way is north. They also have inner ear. Um, actually, I got a question in the chat from Julie. Um, that I'm gonna just pull aside and answer right now because I am watching the chat too. It says a clarification question. Um, I'm, gonna, so, okay, I'm gonna read it. I'm gonna read it just so I can understand it a little bit better. Um, it was about the bone structure. I implied um, that inhaled air goes into the bones or at least that was um, the understanding of this person. Is that true? If so, oxygen absor absorbed into the blood there in the bones or is it in the lungs? Um, excellent question. I really appreciate this question. Um, so it is a little bit difficult to explain and I do apologize for um, explaining it not clearly the very first time. Um, whenever, whenever a human inhales and exhales, for example, we do keep some of that oxygen as we exhale. So we are absorbing oxygen with every inhalation and with every exhalation. However, um, oxygen is absorbed through the lungs and is moved into the blood system. When birds inhale and exhale, they are able to increase the amount of oxygen moving into their lungs, into their blood, and into their bones through all those structures. I don't know if I'm explaining it a little bit more. Um, birds breathe faster and they have all those air, um, all those air pockets within their bones. So as oxygen moves from their lungs to their blood, to their bones, um, there is more oxygen moving in that direction with every inhala inhalation and with every exhalation. I don't know what the percentages are, however, but I know with a human, it's very low, and with a bird, it's significantly higher. Um, Tom, I believe this was your question. If that was still unclear, I really suggest that we Google it at the end, if we have time, or Google it on your own. Um, I apologize, it wasn't really clear. Um, it is really difficult to explain, but because birds have this really strong um, air pocket filled bone structure, it allows them to um, keep more oxygen with every inhale and exhale breath. I hope that helps. Um, I am going to leave the chat closed just for a moment. Um, the only reason why that came up is because Julie asked me through the chat. So thank you, Julie. You're doing a great job moderating. Um, we are going to jump back in to the presentation. We did cover eyes and the brain. And then we also, we're also going to talk about the inner ears very, very quickly. So a bird's inner ears have uh, tiny concentrations of iron in them to sort of act as an internal compass. So that will help guide them to which way north is. And the third one is their olfactory gland. Um, a bird's beak may have a map 
that uses its olfactory gland to smell their way around. Now an olfactory gland is picking up chemical smells as opposed to just um, um, basic smells that, for example, a human can smell. Um, but an olfactory gland is picking up specifically on those chemicals and those chemical changes in the magnetic field. Um, those changes can trigger nerves in the bird's beak and that can help them orient to where north is or to a particular place. Okay, so very quickly, we covered a lot of stuff just now. <laughs> I apologize if any of it was unclear. Um, Tom, thank you for reaching out to Julie and asking for clarification. I'm not sure if I was able to answer it with any more detail. If I wasn't, I apologize. Um, but for sake of time, we are going to push on. If we have time at the end, we can look a little bit more into that or we can Google it. Um, or sorry, Tom, you can Google it or any of our participants this evening just to get some more examples and more clarification on that. But due to time, we're gonna press on. I apologize, you guys. Um, so moving on to bird identification, I really wanted to show everyone some common birds we have here in Nevada um, and test your identification skills. So first, there are four keys to identify. They are size and shape or silhouette. That's the first one. And whenever you are looking at a bird, um, even from far away, you can look at its surroundings to see if you can see the general size of what the bird might be. And if you are going to identify the bird through an app or through your guidebook or um, any kind of computer system, this is the first question they'll normally ask you. So there are four different categories. The smallest, of course, is sparrow-sized or smaller, like a hummingbird, for example. Next is robin-sized. The third is crow-sized. And the largest is goose-sized or larger. Now, those are the birds that we looked at. And all birds fall into these categories or in between these categories, sort of a range, but this will help you to identify some birds. Uh, next on the list is color pattern. Now this isn't super reliable only because the plumage or the coloration of the birds throughout the year will change. Um, female birds are often a little bit more drab in color, so they'll be more brown, more tan. They won't have any of those showy colors. So color pattern isn't a uh, super reliable way. Behavior though is. Um, behavior is really unique to some specific birds and this will help you to identify. And last but not least, habitat. For example, here in Nevada, we would never find a snowy owl simply because there's not enough snow here really. Um, and it's not the right habitat for a snowy owl. In, in, um, on the other side of things, we in Nevada won't really have a cardinal um, because they're usually found on the East Coast. Alrighty, so um, I am going to turn on the chat during this next little section of bird identification. If you guys know any of the birds that we're looking at at a time, feel free to type in the answer in the chat. I will be watching. Um, I am going to proceed just a little bit though, just to talk a little bit about them. I see some of you are already identifying, so thank you. Um, first off is, let me make sure I have all my stuff lined up here. First off is the great blue heron. This is the largest and most widespread heron in North America. This, what we're looking at is a male. They're slate gray in the body, chestnut with black accents. They do have this plume back here on the top of their head, a yellow beak, and they wade in the water, um, usually in shallow waters. And then with their really sharp beak, they'll catch their prey, they'll, they're, they're going to spear them. When they fly, they have their S-shaped neck, and that is one of their telltale identification features. Um, next, um, I actually saw a few answers to the second one. Um, 
This second one up here is a white-faced ibis. Now, let me see if I can scroll up in the chat. A couple people said um, not a white-faced ibis, but um, a glossy ibis. Yes, that's what it is. Now, a glossy ibis is this bird's replacement in the east, and we in the west have white-faced ibises. So great identification, you guys. Um, White-faced ibises are um, also a wading bird with a curved bill though, and they use that curved bill to prod, to poke and prod down into the muddy soil to pick up um, leeches, spiders, small fish, frogs, um, crayfish, insect larvae, earthworms, snails, that kind of stuff. Um, what's cool about white-faced ibises is at just four weeks old, these babies start to learn how to fly on their own, which is really neat. And these birds in particular were really affected by the pesticide DDT way back before 1970. If you're not familiar with what DDT does to birds, is large amounts of DDT in a bird's blood it doesn't necessarily affect the bird itself but it does cause their eggs to have a thin, fragile shell so that when the adult birds go to sit and protect those eggs, the eggs will crush. Um, since DDT was banned in 1970 though, 70 though white-faced ibises are making a super great comeback, although it's pretty slow, um, but they are make, making a comeback. All right, last but not least on this page is the great egret. I did see a few people say, snowy egret or um, a stork. They do look similar. Uh, great egrets though are the largest of the egrets. They're slightly smaller than a great blue heron. They have lookalikes like a stork, a cattle egret or a snowy egret. Um, they eat exclusively fish by wading in shallow water and stabbing the fish as they swim by. This bird, though, is the symbol of the National Audubon Society, which is very neat. Um, the Audubon Society, or sorry, the National Audubon Society is an organization founded to protect birds from being killed for their feathers. Um, great egrets, this bird, were hunted almost to extinction only for their feathers. So, all right, moving on. Again, if you know any of these birds, type them into the chat because I am watching. And most of you are right, so I'm very, very impressed. Uh, this first one, all the way on the left, is an American coot. They're a very noisy diving bird with a white bill. They have yellow legs and lobed toes that almost looked oversized for their body. They're not related to ducks, even though they're mistaken for ducks a lot. Um, they live in freshwater ponds, wetlands, swamps, they eat just about anything they can, including um, grass, sedges, algae, beetles, dragonflies, snails. Next is a double-crested cormorant. Yeah, I can see some of you are getting all these right. Perfect. So double-crested cormorant is really common, especially in city parks. Um, they do, um, they're actually the most widespread common cormorant in North America, and they're usually found along freshwater, so city parks, ponds, um, marshes. Um, they're recognized by having a flat, matte, black feather plumage and yellow-orange facial skin right around their face and a gray beak. Um, the color inside of their mouth, though, is bright blue, which is kind of a fun fact. I like that. Um, they're experts in diving and catching small fish, so especially in city parks, if you cast and a double-crested cormorant sees you cast, it might swim toward your pole to eat the bait off your fishing pole. So this is just a reminder to be careful. And then all the way on the right here is a mallard. All of you got this one correct, so good job. Um, mallards are really identifiable simply because the males have that um, dark green head with the white ring around their neck and a bright yellow bill. 
Um, their bodies are gray, dark brown, with a few black tail feathers on the back end, curling up a little bit. Now the females don't have this. They're a little bit more drab, tan, brown, a little bit speckly, but they do have that bright bill. Um, these guys eat a variety of things too. They eat um, larvae, insects, snail seeds, grains, earthworms, you know, all of the above. These guys are dabbling ducks, which means when they eat, they flip. So their backside is up in the air with their feet and their head and their bill are underwater, sifting and straining all that water to get all that food. All right, moving on. Like I said, if you know any of these, type them in. Very first, the easiest I think to identify is a hummingbird. This hummingbird is a Costas hummingbird. Um, like all hummingbirds, this one is very, very small. Uh, Costas hummingbirds only get three and a half inches in length and their wingspan is only one and a third inches long. Um, they're pretty darn aggressive. They can eat insects out of the sky. They can drink nectar from plants. They're very territorial. Um, they can even use their long, narrow beak as a sword to sort of fend off their territory or their feeder, sort of like fencing. All right, next, this is a common poor will. Now, I did see some of you in the chat say nighthawk. You are correct. A poor will is in the family of nighthawks or night jars. This bird was the first discovered to go into hibernation or torpor. Um, this bird's body temperature can drop as low as 41 degrees when resources are scarce and their breathing slows up to 90% for weeks or days at a time. It's really, really fascinating. They're nocturnal, so they're members of the night jar family. They love eating insects. They're awesome at camouflaging, as you can see in this picture. They're actually, um, they look similar and are often uh, misidentified as a small owl simply because of how well they camouflage. But what they do with during the day is hunker down um, in wide open rock or dirt areas and go to sleep. So um, being able to blend in like that helps protect them, but it also means that humans can spot them really easily. These guys are not owls. They are common poor wills. So if you do see one of these birds sleeping during the day, I would suggest taking a picture, moving past very, very quietly. Alrighty, white crowned sparrow and this bottom one is the mountain bluebird. Now the white crowned sparrow is one of the most easily identifiable sparrows simply because of their white stripes on their head. These guys are usually seen in flocks of more than a hundred birds. And um, when they feed, they're usually on the ground. They're not landing on your feeder. Uh, Mountain Bluebird, though, is Nevada State Bird because they're so beautiful. Um, they love open areas with short grasses, shrubs, and trees. They're usually found at around 12,000 feet or so. So down in the southern region of Nevada, we don't have them. Um, but in the northern region of Nevada, they're pretty common to see. Alrighty, these are pretty easy. I'm going to breeze through these pretty quickly because I'm almost positive that you guys will know these. Now in the chat, if you know them, go ahead and type them in. I do see some questions happening in the chat. I just want to remind everyone that if you do have questions, go ahead and type them into the question and answer box for Miss Julie. Perfect. All of you are getting them right. Uh, burrowing owl, the greater road runner and a turkey vulture. I only have a few things to share um, specifically about the turkey vulture. What is so cool about a turkey vulture is one, they're called nature's cleanup crew. They don't build nests, they're like, they lay their eggs just right on the ground. Uh, they fly low to smell their food. What they eat normally is called carrion or dead flesh, dead animals. Um, they can smell this carrion up to five miles away. Um, a couple other really cool facts that are 
sort of gross, but also very fascinating. They can vomit on themselves or projectile vomit when they're threatened. Um, and they're, whenever they, uh, whenever they are a little overheated or are unable to get to a, a lower temperature environment in a hurry, they can defecate on themselves and on their legs and that keeps them cool. So a little bit of a, a neat, gross, fun fact. Here are just a few more. I'm also going to breeze through these as well because we are running a low and a little on time. But I do see some identifications coming through. Excellent job, you guys. So far, you're pretty correct. We have the American kestrel, which is the smallest falcon in North America. The Northern Harrier. And what's cool about the Northern Harrier, Harrier identification wise is they have an owl like face. So they have that facial disc. And they also have a broad white. Um, spot just at the base of their tail. And then all the way on the right here is a Cooper's Hawk. Now a Cooper's Hawk, one of the telltale signs for a Cooper's Hawk for identification is there they have this banded black and white tail. All right, this is really cool. This is found online. I can't take credit for this. This is from um, Cornell Lab of Ornithology. This is the movement of bird migration across North and South America on some of the bird species that were tagged. So these are not active right now, um, but these were individuals moving during their migration. Now, while we're looking at this, first I want to thank you for participating in the identification section. Most of you got all of them correct, so excellent job. I'm going to turn the chat off just for a moment. And I want to see, I want to, yeah, I want to see if you guys can find these numbers. Now there is a red star where Nevada is. So we do have some of these birds moving directly across Nevada, namely number 72, the Pacific Slope flycatcher, and a warbler, the hermit warbler, number 51. Um, you, this, this can be found online at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It's really cool to watch because it just cycles through the year over and over again. It's very, very neat. Uh, just a couple fun facts. Hummingbirds are the smallest migratory bird. Um, they travel for very far distances. The longest any bird has migrated is 16,000 miles, which is really neat. Um, by the time they reach their stopover site, they're very, very hungry. So having your feeder out in the winter time would help birds a lot. They almost always return home after migration. They bulk up to prepare for migration, similar to how a bear would bulk up before um, hibernation. They migrate at different times of the year. There are so many hazards that they have to look out for during their migration. Um, some of those hazards are predators, dehydration, starvation, windmills, power stations, climate change. Um, yeah, like I said, as soon as they land, they're so hungry. And just a, a quick one, feeding bread to your ducks and geese at your park can actually cause more harm than good. Uh, what we would recommend if you do want to go birding at your local park and you do have some of those ducks and geese walk up to you, don't feed them. You know, we want to keep them as wild as possible. And um, this will also help them or um, help keep them wild and uh, make sure that they do get to migrate. Um, as far as observing wildlife, we're always looking for feathers. We're always looking for shells, nuts, eggshells. We can also look for owl pellets, nests. Um, whenever you see a sign of any of these three things, that's a huge uh, signal that birds are either present or will be present soon. You can also look for tracks, scat, which is just another way to say poop, you know, bird poop, or whitewash. Uh, you can also look for the bird themselves. And this is a picture, I love this picture. This is um, some um, great horned owl tracks in the sand. Now, if you're really looking when you're out birding, we always recommend look down 
out and up because some of these signs that birds are around, you really have to look for them, especially nests and tracks. When you observe wildlife, be quiet, be patient. Um, it always helps to move slowly, smoothly, quietly, keep your distance. We always recommend to stay on established trails. Bring the right tools with you, you know, binoculars, camera, field guides. Um, always stay away from their young. A lot of birds are very territorial, so they want to protect their territory, their nest, and their young. Um, and of course, don't feed the animals. You want to keep them wild. And any questions? Um, I know that this was a lot of information. We are just a tad over on time, but I really want to thank everyone for coming. And just a quick reminder, we live in an amazing place and we live with wildlife on a daily basis, even if we can't see it. So um, I am going to close the chat, perfect. And thank you again. Um, one thing that you guys can help us by improving our programs is getting some of your feedback. So just after we're done here, there will be a short survey that pops up. Just take a, just a few moments. Um, it's not very many questions, but it really helps us um, improve programs moving forward. We have so many incredible staff members who have so many different passions about lots of different topics. So I really encourage everyone to go back, tune in on another webinar coming up later this week, next week, the following week. Also, this presentation is being recorded and will be found on our YouTube channel in a little bit. You know, we, you got to give us just a couple days to get it edited and then up. Um, but thank you so much. We really, really appreciate it. I was actually very impressed by everyone's knowledge. Um, I thought for sure that I would stump some of you <laughs> on some of those questions, but all of you did great. Um, we covered a lot of information. Some of it was basic, but I really appreciate you participating, talking through the chat. So thank you so much. Um, now, before I say goodbye, I'm going to go up into the question and answer box just to see if there are any questions that we weren't able to cover. Um, now, Julie did an amazing job um, answering all those questions. And um, for those of you who were with us in the middle of the PowerPoint presentation, um, I did go back and clarify some of the questions. One in particular, I don't think I did a good job, <laughs> um, but um, it, it, is, it is a little complicated. Um, we were talking about the, the, the air the air sacs within the, um, the bone structure of birds that birds have. So um, I think I did an okay job going back and explaining that, but if I didn't, I apologize. Um, I really encourage you guys to do your research, look up things that we weren't able to cover today. Um, there's so much more information that I would love to cover, but I only have an hour and I'm already over time. <laughs> Um, I do see a lot of questions coming in right now. One is, when is a good time to water my plants in the garden with the quail family? Excellent question. I would say, especially in the spring and summer. Uh, right now, over the last couple months, especially, all the babies are out. Quail babies are the cutest bird babies I've ever seen. Those little chicks are like little cotton balls. So I would say making sure that they have plenty of plants to eat, they do eat insects as well. Insects love those fresh new growth on those plants. So I would say spring and summer for sure. Um, does Nevada have any endemic birds and are there species of special concern that are declining rapidly? The answer is complicated. <laughs> Um, Laura, thank you so much for asking. I would go to a few different websites to answer this question, one of which is Red List Online. It gives you, Red List Online is a website that gives you the federal and local listing status of whatever animal that you're typing in. So you can look for specific species, um, 
general groups of birds. Um, it's super useful. That's a good one. Um, will quails eat apple seeds? The answer is no, um, unless it's a very confused quail. <laughs> um, there are lots of other plants and seeds and grain that quails do eat. I would look at either um, the Cornell, Cornell Lab of Ornithology. They have a bird um, website called All About Birds. It's spectacular. It, it does list diet for all the birds that they have in their database. Let's see. I love it. Thank you so much. Um, Okay, one more question, I think. It's from Laura. It says, um, I looked the other day and none of these webinars are on Endo's YouTube channel. Can you send something out to attendees to let us know when they're posted? The answer is unfortunately no. Um, my recommendation, Laura, and for those of you who are participating too, is to just keep checking back. Depending on how busy some of our other staff members are, it can take a um, couple days, um, you know, we are, a lot of us are working from home right now, which is quite honestly uh, something new and it was a challenge in the beginning too. So sometimes editing can take extra time. Sometimes um, we, there are sound issues, sometimes there are video issues. So I would say just keep checking back. You can sign up for alerts through the YouTube channel itself. Um, there's like a little bell icon that you can click on and then you'll get an email alert whenever we post a new uh, video. That might be your best option. I would also go to our Facebook page to see what other topics are um, going to be talked about. This is just one of the many. We talk about elusive animals, we talk about nocturnal animals, uh, we did an owl pellet dissection just a couple weeks ago, we talk about Cats of Nevada, you know, we cover so many topics. I would just keep checking back. Um, so with that said, thank you so, so much. Uh, one more thing on the very last slide here, I would love to say is that we know that you're a supporter of wildlife and outdoors and we thank you, thank you, thank you. At this time, we advise that you um, be careful, be safe, take all the necessary safety precautions. You know, we don't want you to, um, we don't want you to get sick. We don't want you to pass the sickness on, but we want you to embrace the outdoors if you can and practice responsible recreating. Um, if you do have any additional questions, my, um, my contact information should be on the page, it's not. <laughs> there it is. My contact information is on the screen. You can email me anytime. We love helping with bird identification, scat identification, animal identification. If you have any questions, just email us and we hope to see you at another webinar soon. Check back on our Facebook page for more. Uh, thank you so much. You guys have a brilliant evening and we hope to see you again soon.